Welcome to Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where we connect authors with new listeners and provide advice to aspiring authors on the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter. So hi there, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for coming back to the Authors of the Pacific Northwest. And today we do have uh, the privilege of having a pretty exceptional author on. His name is William Knauer. Did I say it right? William? You did. Perfect. Awesome. Now, everybody, I will slip in because he does go by Bill. So it's also Bill, but you can find him on his website by Williams um, Knauer. So uh, Bill, say hi to my listeners. Hi, listeners. (laughs) How are you doing? Oh, we're so good. We're so glad to have you. So like Bill and I were talking a little bit before I hit record. So I thought, hey, we got to just jump on and hit record because it's good stuff. So listeners, you know, I go out and hunt out down authors all the time to bring on the show. And I found Bill through um, an announcement in the Pacific Northwest, one of the um, newsletters that I follow. So Bill, tell us a little bit. First, let's start out by where you're, where you reside in the Northwest. What state are you? I, I live in Seattle. In the great oh. city state of Seattle, yeah, a city uh, and state I've been for here sure. <laughs> since 1990. Oh, see, that was my follow-up question. So, uh, are you a, a transplant versus? Yeah. But honestly, in the 90s, I would say you're a resident. Uh, you know, I still don't feel like one. Uh, I grew up in Rhode Island, and uh, but I chased a girl out here, oh, and I yeah. caught her. And, wow, those and, Northwest girls, I tell you. <laughs> well, no, she was a Providence girl oh. who, who moved out here and broke my heart, and I found her. You found her. Married her. And so, well, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My husband, a little story about me. We're both Northwesterners, but he took off and went to LA um, way wow. before I met him and came back just to visit. And I was here. And that was the end of his story in LA. <laughs> well, you know what? Actually, I come here by way of Los Angeles. I was oh. down there in LA thinking I wanted to be a screenwriter. Oh, yeah. yeah. I did not want to be one. But that's when I started I got back in contact with my now wife and then so were you down in LA before the 90s or well 89 89 89 to 90 uh and then um yeah and then yeah back and I didn't last long I didn't last long yeah LA is an interesting place now I haven't lived there so I live vicariously through my husband's life and stories but um he was down there early 80s so he left in the early late 70s to chase rock and roll so he's a drummer wow oh very good yeah he did very well and went down there and um about the time, so we, he came back up in 92, and that was when grunge was pretty heavy yeah, in the Northwest yeah. again. So he's like, well, it's dying. The hair boy, band boys are dying, you know, kind of thing. So he came up to the Northwest to start back up in music in the Seattle, Portland area. So, so came home. That's <laughs> and awesome. We, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Fun stories. Um, so, but LA's, the thing I love about LA versus, or California versus um, the Northwest is that we are now in the winter time. So if you're listening to um, yeah. when I talk right now um, and you don't live in the Northwest, you wouldn't understand this. We get dark at like four o'clock in the e- afternoon. Just pitch black. <laughs> it's yeah. like dark, yeah. which is great for authors, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else to do. So, so Bill, share with my listeners that don't know you. So now I did a lot of research on you and I've listened to quite a bit of stuff off your um, website. So give us a little bit of information about you because you have your own podcast, you're, you're a coach for writers, you have some yeah. really awesome books. So if you met somebody on the street that didn't <laughs> know you, right, yeah. give us, give them that, give my listeners who you are. So I'm, a, I wear a number of hats. I'm the editor in chief of Author Magazine, which is an online magazine for writers and readers. I've been doing that since 2008. And um, I write uh, for a while. It was five days a week, a daily like essay, a column, we'll call it. it used to be called a blog, but it's really a column. Mm-hmm. I still do that three times a week. Um, and we publish articles on writing. And I also do video interviews mm-hmm. with all kinds of authors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been watching some of them. <laughs> so it goes them. back a ways. You know, I, everyone from, from Henry Winkler and Caroline Kennedy to Nora Ephron to Ken Robinson. But also like first time romance writers mm-hmm. and suspense writers and poets, and all kinds of writers. Um, and uh, I still do one a month of those. And those are, you can find them on YouTube. You can find them on authormagazine.org. That's where yeah. so I do that. And I do, and really that's where my, my real career started. Uh, even though I've been writing all my life, when I switched over from writing, trying to write fiction, which was just not quite the right fit for me, although mm-hmm. I 
tried like Cinderella's sisters to make that shoe fit. <laughs> it really, it really didn't. Uh-huh. And it was when I shifted over to sort of personal essay, spiritual, non narrative, nonfiction memoir in that general category that my career took off. I found really the most comfortable place for my voice. And those little essays that I was writing turned into a book called Write Within Yourself, mm-hmm. published in 2014. I can't remember when I published that. And, and that's a collection of little essays about the writing. Oh, at the intersection of, I don't really write about the craft of writing too much, Vicki, mm-hmm. although I teach it mm-hmm. um, when I teach, but I really am interested in the spiritual or the uh, spiritual and the emotional journey of writing, the emotional challenges mm-hmm. of writing, mm-hmm. about what it is to f- look at a blank page and say, what do I want to see on it? And the, the, also the challenge of sharing your work with strangers mm-hmm. and, what, and, and, and addressing all the stuff about voice and intelligence and value that comes up as we try and share work, which led to the other book I published called Fearless Writing. That was out in 2017. Fearless Writing, How to Create Boldly and Write with Confidence. And that's really about the... The I think the core fear that faces all all writers, mm-hmm. and and it grew out of my own experience, but also grew out of all the conversations I've had with Pulitzer Prize winning authors, and number one New York Times best selling authors, living authors, and dead authors. Who yeah, yeah. Dead authors, you know all about what it means to sh- to to because sh- to, to, to to be an author, you have to to sh- to to write your best stuff, mm-hmm. to write the stuff you want to share with people. You have to forget about the people you're going to share your work with in order to write something you can share with them. You and cannot think about writer the audience while you are writing, and that is so challenging. Uh, it's, it's horrifying, whole, <laughs> right? But that is what the, I wrote a whole book about because that one core fear of trying to get into other people's heads. Yep. yep. As you write, it's what it's what it's why I'm interested in it's author magazine, and author, and the podcast I do is called Author to Author. That's every. Mm-hmm. Tuesday, author two, the number two author. Mm-hmm. I do that live. Mm-hmm. Another another ha- conversation. It's about being an author because you're an author as soon as you share your work with another person. As yeah. soon as you share your work with another person, you know you've got no control over what happens, and you also know if you're an, whether you're a brand new writer or you've been doing it for your whole life that um, you may want people to like your stuff, and maybe even need people to like your stuff, but you can't control whether they like your stuff. Uh-huh, and so how you just can't do it. And so how as a writer, do you focus on what you can control? And not so this is what I'm interested in. And the big reason I'm interested in it is that I think, as I say in my podcast every week, what it takes to write the book you want to write is what it takes to lead the life you want to lead. And so the things we learn in facing the blank page and writing the kind of stuff we want to write translates to, I just got an email from a reader who picked up fearless writing. He said, Oh, I love this book, but everything in it is applying to the rest of my life. And yeah. I could have, I could have called it fearless living. I was going to, but my agent yeah. said, no, don't do that. Yeah. And yeah. so that's really what I'm interested in is helping. How does writing help us learn how to live? I, I love it. And that's one huge reason why I wanted to bring you on. So my listeners know every author I bring on is a selfish motivation on my end. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, Good. But, then they get, but then they get the benefit of it, right? Yes, so, absolutely. So there's so many things that are rolling around in my mind hearing you say this because it's really pinnacle to where I'm at right now. Um, my podcast came out of me asking a lot of just authors around me, published independent authors, um, you know, traditional authors, people that were working on um, being published. And I was asking them questions. How'd you get published? You know, because I was, I was writing in the closet, how I like to say it. I had been writing for a long time, but I'd only been sharing it with my husband because of that fear of a lot of fears, but the, the huge self doubt of, you know, nobody's going to like what I have to say or my voice isn't valid. It took me years and going into a whole different profession. I'm in higher ed. And now my whole job is encouraging students to finish their degree. And as I'm every day encouraging students to do that, I'm like, I'm not living my true self because I'm not encouraging myself to finish what I really want to do is to be an author, to yeah, write full time. Yeah. And so it's funny because um, this is very pinnacle. So then the podcast got created and it exploded, right? So it's taken on a life of itself, which is lovely, but my writing time is getting narrow and narrow. And right. so I'm like, well, maybe the podcast and doing some other podcast work has some value also in it for me besides writing and, and at doing the creative aspect of the podcast. And um, I, I found a mentor, a really amazing mentor. 
Okay. And now she's doing it full time, Sarah Warner. She's pretty well known. And um, so we're working on some podcast stuff and ideas. And in the process of that, it's bringing me back full circle to, you know, what is the focus? The focus was that I wanted to be a full time writer. I wanted to leave my day job and write and encourage other people to write and, you know, help other people along their journey. So, yeah. so I love it. So going forward, you talked about you, you in all your interviews and you've done a lot of interviews with authors, a lot, um, a lot which is <laughs> amazing because I can't wait for 10, 15 years down the road where I can say, I've had this person on my podcast, yeah. you know, it's so exciting. Yeah. But um, the one pinnacle part that you say that is something that we as authors that are working towards publication or even publication is we get told all the time to think about your readers. Oh like, God. Picture oh, your audience. What, no, well, so, all right, you know, so let me, let me break that down. Good. Because <laughs> so it, it's like, it's really like that question. Should I, do I picture my audience? The answer is both yes and no. Mm-hmm. Here's how it's yes. You do want to, you do, one of the challenging things about being a writer is you are having to translate what you see in your mind into language so that someone who isn't in your mind could see some version of it, Mm -hmm. right? They're not going to see exactly what you see. So being aware that someone who isn't you is going, you know, I teach a lot of personal narrative Mm -hmm. where the writers are writing about their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm having to remind them a lot is like, look, no one knows what you've been through that you aren't writing this for your sister who knows so yeah. much about you and yeah. you can talk in a shorthand to her. The exactly. reader knows nothing about you. And in fact, it's in- interesting to me as I began writing about my own life, I realized I knew nothing about my reader except that they're human and maybe they're a writer. Mm-hmm. But that's really it. I don't know if they're gay or straight or black or white or young or old or what, right? I don't know anything about them. Mm-hmm. All I know is that they're human. And so I have to connect with them on that level. Mm-hmm. And so what's the most universal thing about my experience I can write about that could connect the most number of people? And, you know, and so I, that's what, when I picture a, the, the reader, that's what I'm trying to connect to. They're sort of universal humanness that I can get in touch with myself. Now, if you're writing, now, do you write fiction? I, uh, I'm working on historical fiction. Yeah. Okay. Do you read historical fiction? Tons of it. Yeah. Okay. So this is a good sign. So that means that when, what, when you're picturing your reader, what you picture is somebody who loves it as much as you do. Mm-hmm. And, and the way to picture that is to picture how much you love it. Mm-hmm. So I'm right now, I've been contracted to write something, an adventure for a role-playing game uh, oh, called fun. Dungeons and Dragons. I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's something else I did a while ago. I actually won the award for best role-playing adventure. Oh, really? A oh, long time ago, yeah. So I'm doing it again. And so what I do is I picture how much I like this particular game. Mm-hmm. And I think how fun it is. And so the reader of the book I'm writing is someone who likes it as much as me. So picture, so if you're picturing your, your, your love, your reader who should be a lover of historical fiction, picture why you love it, picture the thing you love about it. And so that's the, that's the reader you're imagining. Mm -hmm. And, but you're, it's really not a specific person, but Mm -hmm. what you're not trying to do is please that person. You just connect to the reader in you, the lover of historical fiction in you and write to her. Right. And write what you think, because here's the thing. Think about what you love about historical fiction and think about what you think could be maybe a little different about it. The thing you'd like to see more of, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. One of my favorite stories was from Jerry Russell, the romance writer, who um, was, uh, she got pregnant and it was one of these pregnancies where she had to be in bed for the last like six months or three months or something. So uh-huh. she was just, you know, so, so she was there and she's bored. So she starts reading and she starts mm-hmm. reading all these romance novels and she likes them, but she doesn't like the endings. Yeah. She's really frustrated with the ends. So she starts rewriting their endings. Oh, I love it. <laughs> the woman wasn't being independent enough. She was relying too much on the guy to say it. Yeah. So she starts changing her endings. And then, and because she loved romance, but she liked it. And then she said, well, listen, I really, my favorite part is not reading the story, it's rewriting the endings. Maybe I should just try writing my own book. So you see for her, yeah. her, she began finding her voice by finding the thing that she wanted to do differently. And in fact, even the adventures I'm writing, I, I found my publisher and won the awards and such because I was reading these adventures and thinking, you know, it would be better if they did it this way, which is too, yeah. too yeah. weedy for me to explain. But there was yeah. things about it that thought could be done differently. Yeah. So you want to focus on what you, why you love it and what you can do different about it. But what you cannot do is sit there and ask yourself, I wonder what they will think of it. Yeah. I, that, that, like I feel like that's self-sabotage, but we do it often. In self- Fearless writing is all about how not to ask that question. Yeah. Because as yeah. soon as you ask that question, because here's the thing, your mind is fantastic at answering questions. If you say, 
well, you know, what does my, who does my heroine love? Does she love anybody? Is she, mm-hmm. does she do something for a living? What does she like to eat? What does she like to wear in the morning? Yep. Your imagination can answer those questions, right? Mm-hmm. But if you ask your imagination, will women between the ages of 35 and 55 like this book? It's like, it has no idea. It doesn't know mm-hmm. if someone, it doesn't know what an agent will think of it. It doesn't know who will buy it. It doesn't know who will like it. It can't answer that question for you. But if you think you've got to know the answer to it, weirdly, your imagination will try to answer a question it can't. And it'll all happen very fast. And you will feel like a failure immediately mm-hmm. because you're trying to answer something you can't. The only thing you can answer is, what do I think the coolest, most interesting, most compelling thing my character and not what will what could I write that will please people? Don't oh, don't yeah, think that. Exactly. Yeah. Think, what would you know me at what would please me as the reader of historical fiction that I am? Now that you can answer. That and I so, can. That yes. you can. And and so, but it's but Vicky, it's so tough because you do need people to like your stuff. Yeah. But well, somebody's gotta like it. Right. So here's, here's the burning question I have. So right. I've written, let's, let's put me fast forward. Right. Sure. So I've written this book that I absolutely love. And I wrote it for me with that audience that we're talking about in mind of historical um, fiction audience, but I don't have a, a super clear picture of anything except that I hope that they enjoy it from, you know, cause right. I enjoy right. it. How do right. we pitch that as an author? So what you find your how, agent and all those how other do you things. do it? Here's what you do. I teach a class called fearless marketing. It's also called marketing for authors who hate to market. Yes, of, most of us do, really. And there's a, there's well, I, actually, I love marketing, but not everybody does. Not everybody does, but a lot of them don't like because the whole point of fearless writing is all about, look, don't get into other people's heads. Don't yeah. get into your reader's heads. But if ever there's a time where we do get into someone's head, it's when we pitch our book mm-hmm. because we're trying to get someone to like our book, we think. Yep. Yep. You can't do that. What you do is when you're pitching your book, quote unquote, what you do is you go back and you think, why is this book awesome? Mm-hmm. Why do I love this book? You go to the same place within yourself from which you wrote the book. And from that place, you talk about it. Why you talk about, you say, okay, if I'm writing a query letter, I'm going to spend this, you know, two paragraphs, which is what you get to describe mm-hmm. the plot usually. Mm-hmm. Talking, thinking about why it's so awesome and describing why it's so awesome, thinking about how much I love it, not trying to get into the the head of the agent, but just make sure that what's on the page captures in two paragraphs, at least as best it can, why it's so awesome. Just think about how much you love it. Think why it's cool. Think why it's different. Think about what you wrote about, why you wrote it. Do not think, how can I get them to like it? Because you'll mm-hmm. never know that. But mm-hmm. think about why you love it. If you can think about why you love it and why you wrote it, That is the thing you can hold on to because you do know that. You don't have to know what other people like. You don't have to know what the agent's like. You don't have to know what the editor's like. What you're looking for is someone who likes the same thing you do. And just like when you met your husband and you connected in this way that he's a nice-looking guy, I'm sure, but you probably met a lot of nice-looking guys. Mm -hmm. And it's just something different about him that you connected for reasons you can't – well, it's the same thing with your agent, with your editor. You meet someone and they're like a friend and it just – makes sense. And that's what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. But you can't find that friend if you misrepresent yourself, if mm-hmm. you pretend you're something you're not. And the only way to be authentic is say, this is why I love it. And I'm going to focus on why I love it. And I'm not going to apologize for writing it. I'm not going to try to say it's something it's not. I'm just going to talk about why it's so awesome. That's how you do it. I love it. And it feels like the theme for me recently, my listeners, that they've listened in sequence to the last few um, authors I've had on we've had a lot of discussion with authors about living your authentic life and living, you know, writing authentically who you are or, you know, and and I feel like that is so imperative, but it also is very uh, scary to put yourself out in that realm. I mean, I think it's easier sometimes to put a mask on, right. Right. And, and and to uh, almost like a facade, but I feel like what you're saying what I'm taking it is, is that you're not really going to have the true success that will be meaningful to you unless you operate in this kind of a mindset. Oh, absolutely. In fact, you'll just be constantly chasing that. That's right. And in fact, writers, rejection, rejection was a big theme for me in my life, trying to understand it, what it is and what it isn't. And here's the interesting thing about rejection. Where's the two places we most experience it? Well, we were, if we're writers, we experience it in our submission. But the, mm-hmm. other, the place everybody experiences is in romance, is in yeah. love, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and if you go to writers' conferences now, 
a lot of the pitching is speed pitching and it's oh, really know. Like for speed dating. And I'm, I'm just like dead set against it. I think I feel it. So I, for me, I don't think I can handle it. You'd be fine. But I'll tell you, so you know, there's a way to do it, but it's actually not so bad because agents yeah. are very nice people. Some yeah. of them. Yeah. <laughs> some, of them not, some of them are a little, have gotten a little jaded, but yeah. a lot of them really are ten, understand that writers are tender hearted, nervous people. And they're, yeah. Right. Yeah. but this is the truth. Young man. I saw my wife on a, in a play. And I was like, I've got to meet her. She was a senior at another, another high school. And my, went to, my brother went to that high school and my brother was in the play with her. And I was like, I've got to meet this person. And so I called her blind. My brother had said, my brother wants to call you. And she said, okay, fine. Whatever. <laughs> but I had asked out a bunch of other girls. I, I was a senior in high school. I dated and mm-hmm. I, I was nervous when I'd ask somebody out. It's a very nerve wracking experience for a guy, can be. Mm-hmm. And I went to call her and I picked up the phone and I realized I wasn't nervous. Huh. at all. Hmm. And that is because for the first time, I didn't just want a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. I wanted her. Mm-hmm. She was interesting to me in a way that none of, and the other girls were perfectly nice and attractive. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. I was interested for the first time. I was actually interested in her. And so what happened is I didn't reject myself by making myself ask out someone I wasn't authentically interested in. Oh, I love this parallel. You Very- see, and writers are rejecting themselves all the time mm-hmm. because they don't write the book they actually want to write. Mm-hmm. They write the book yep. they think they're supposed to write. And yep. if you, the metaphor I always use is the book you're meant to write is the book you is the book you want to write in the way you want to write it is like a perfect glass of lemonade. It's delicious. It's got the exact blend of sweet and 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 sour, right? Mm-hmm. Delicious. But every time you start input, d- dropping in what you think people want, what, mm-hmm. every time you bring a self-consciousness to it and start writing a little bit for your audience, it's like a little drop of white vinegar in mm-hmm. that lemonade. And, mm-hmm. and, and people will drink it and, and they'll say, God, this is just something kind of off. And they, don't, they can't tell what it is. Yeah. And they try to tell you to change the main character yeah. or edit that yeah. third scene. But all it is is you putting drop after drop of self-doubt in yeah. there. And it just infects it in a way no one can. And so what people, and everybody wants a perfect glass of lemonade. Yeah. And so there's really, you don't get, there's no wiggle room with, with this. You have to, you, and, and you talked about the mask. You see, the reason we put the mask on is if they reject my mask, fine. Yeah. If I They're take not the mask off, me. now they can reject me. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's painful. Yeah. I'd rather wear the mask and always say, well, they never reject. But the truth is, once you actually take the mask, you're rejecting yourself with the mask. You're exactly. absolutely, and that's the real pain. That's yeah. the real pain. Yeah, I love it. Well, I love that analogy about the lemonade. And for my experience, so like I, oh, my listeners know this, Bill. So I feel like, you know, you, you're dropping into a conversation with others that you didn't know. So Great. filling you in a little bit. Um, so I started writing my first novel officially a year ago, which were alongside this podcast. And I was not a part of a writer's group. I had no mm. feedback or anything. And I was terrified with feedback sure. because my experience in the past in academic situations or in my job situations, I was asked to write specific things that I didn't agree with, meaning I was in leadership and I had to write warnings for people that we need to fire, you know, and it was just horrifying to me. So I couldn't do it. I literally had writer's block. And um, so once I got stepped out of that role and I started to write for myself, this particular story, I was a little nervous about feedback. I was graciously invited into an amazing writing group in our area, our local area. They invited me in and I was really nervous, but I believed in the story I was writing in. And I'm like, you know, maybe this will be a different experience because I haven't experienced this before where authors that understand authors themselves, you know, they all are writing and published as well. Um, The kind of feedback they're going to give me will hopefully be the the kind of feedback I will either enhance the writing or I can reject it and just say, oh, that doesn't fit the story and be comfortable with it. That has exactly been what it has been. But also, I've grown so much in the craft with them because it's the first time I've been able to accept people say, oh, you know what? I don't know if you know this, but A, B, and C. And I'm like, I have no idea. So fabulous, fabulous experience. But I've stayed very, very true to the story as I'm working on it. (laughs) And and I'm loving it. It's a great experience. So um, I'm finding a little bit out about what you're saying. So for me, the next step, obviously, is getting the book finished. And that is another roadblock, I'm sure that maybe you talk with other authors about of when do you say stop? When do you, you know, 
or more importantly, when it's done, how yeah. do you know to have that step of faith to step out and say, okay, it's good enough to start putting out there and finding an author? Well, you know, it's a, there's a couple things. First of all, it's trial and error. And mm-hmm. so books, I mean, a book, uh, you may, it's not unusual for a first novel to think it's done before it's done. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> and so that, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's part of the reason we share our work with, and the best thing about sharing your work with a, a, re, a reading group, you know, a writing group is that people can, there's what you think you wrote and what people are reading. And sometimes they can help. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's the reason comedians try their material out in front of audiences because it seems funny, but sometimes there's a disconnect between what you're pointing to, what mm-hmm. you're trying to show people and what they're seeing. Yeah. And so that can be helpful. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Well, it's just, you know, because it's, it, it's in your head. Mm-hmm. Now it's on a page. And it's a translation process. And sometimes it translates and sometimes it doesn't. You know, uh, people, sometimes they just get it. And sometimes it so it's helpful, I think, to, to begin to learn when you're leaving too much out or when you're putting too much in. You know, mm-hmm. your readers can tell you, like, you, you've told me this three times already. I get it. Like, yeah. you don't need to my, and that's fine. You know, so this is all part of the craft and you begin yeah. to learn that. And so and, it's, and with a book, it's sometimes, it, you know, we get impatient and you think it's done. And so... There's no way really to know that for sure, but through practice and you'll, you'll know if, you know, agents will tell you and your friends will tell you, but a, an agent can love your book and say, it's not done, but I love it. And let's, let's work on it together. Yeah, One exactly. thing you got to know is this about finishing books is you never really get the feeling of finish that you think you're going to get because the creative process never ends. You know, the muse doesn't stop the muse, I don't think she doesn't know about endings. Mm-hmm. She just just keeps going and going and going. And so she, she, there's always going to be something else in you that wants saying. And so you have to allow that the book is a smaller thing than your whole life. So it's one idea, mm-hmm. basically. Usually, most stories are one idea, um, and you will never feel that complete and utter satisfaction. I don't think. You know, I was listening to John Lennon talk about the song "A Day in the Life." one of my favorite pieces of recorded music, you know, just as a work of recorded art. And he's like, yeah, I liked it, but we didn't quite get it as the way I wanted it to. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's a great, I thought just a marvelously engineered piece of music, but not quite for him because we always feel the, the, the because the creative spark doesn't end and mm-hmm. it, and we always feel within us the itch for the next story. Mm-hmm. So you have to get comfortable with, Kind of just letting the thing go because mm. this is the other thing, Vicky, is to remember. And you can't know this yet because you're because you're so far just in the writing process. Oh, you're, yes, mm-hmm. and you're sharing it with readers, but with with your writing group. But that is not a reader. A no, reader is exactly. just up for pleasure. Mm-hmm. Thing you have to remember is you finish a story, you start a story, and the reader finishes the story. Mm-hmm. The reader is the one that finishes the story. They're the one that brings their own imagination to it, and they bring it to life in ways that you can't imagine. And mm-hmm. so there is a thing missing from every story, and that's the reader. Mm-hmm. You have to get make peace with that uh, because there's nothing, and you won't be there when it gets finished <laughs> yeah. for the most part. Yeah. And so that's partly what you're going to feel. And so one of the maturing process of being an author is learning what it actually means to say, I think I've done as much as I can do with this. And gotcha. That's, gotcha. And that's, that's a trial and error thing. But that, that's good for me because I'm at a point where the two things that you talked about just now, the streams that you talked about that really hit home with me is A, the muse, um, you know, I have to embrace the fact that this, I know this is not my only story. And I know within this story, there's several versions, you know, several pieces to it, but also there's several other stories that are just floating around in my head waiting to come out, but I'm not willing to work on them until I get to a comfortable place of saying, okay, now this story we can pause and we can move on to something else. Cause I feel like you got to stay in the flow, (laughs) at least with this one, I just stay in the flow. And I've been frustrated in the sense that I'm like, if there was more time in my day, I could probably work on three books at once, <laughs> but there's just sure. not, you know, just like I personally can't read more than one book at a time because right. I, as a reader, I really get. Into How many it. hours do you usually get? In writing? For writing. Yeah, in a for day. writing alone in a day. I'm lucky if I get two hours. That's great. That's day. great. Maybe. No, no, that's good. That's yeah. good. You can get plenty done. Yeah. You know, I just interviewed Sean Wong, who's a, writing professor at the university of Washington. And he's had a weird life in that he's kind of brushed paths with some huge writers. His, his, his main teacher was Kay Boyle, 
Oh, dear. In the 60s. And she was friends with James Joyce and Ernest Hemingway. And oh, wow. And all the great modernists. And when he was off at a writing retreat, he got advice from Susan Sontag at this <laughs> writing retreat. And she said to him, you know, look, you wrote a page. If you write a page a day, every day, how many pages are you going to have in a year? Oh, it's 365. Well, two hours, that's a page. You could easily do a page in two hours. You're probably doing more. And so two hours is fine. Two hours is fine. If you can do more fine, I, I don't, I don't want to write more than two hours in a day. I yeah. get toast. I just, well, I'm, and that, and that's broken writing, you know, because like all my listeners know that I don't, I have a day job, so I have to fit everything in around that yeah, day job. Yeah. But luckily I'm blessed because my day job is one that I'm, I'm a remote employee. So I work from home. Oh, nice. Okay. So so I, I don't have to leave my house and my space. So I still get to be in my space and in my thought process while I'm working. So that's super helpful for me. But I do feel like my biggest challenge is, is that I'm a goal setter. And so I put those visions out for myself and I say, right. By this date, I want A, B, and C done. Right. You know, but I don't hit a particular goal. I'm like, okay, now I need to restructure and not get hard on myself because yeah. I'm my biggest critic. Um, I, and I know that the writing process really, truly, that when you're writing, the creative process is so fantastic when you can just sit back and do it and not have every other distraction get in. The yeah. Way. I, one thing I do recommend for writing in terms of distractions and so on, it's a mechanical fix. But it can help, which is to do the writing first thing when you wake up. Yeah, the, that's my most productive time. Yeah, sure. That's when I do it. I've done it that way since in the 90s, since I started writing my first book. And I, it's, it, it's good because I think your mind is freshest then. Mm -hmm. And also, this is important, Vicki, is that thought has momentum to it. Mm -hmm. So things you're thinking about has a kind of momentum. So even so, if you turn on the TV and there's something political on and maybe you're interested and whatever you look at, even if you turn off the TV, the, you're still going to be filled up with the momentum of whatever you were watching. Mm -hmm. I'll sometimes watch movies and I can't go to sleep that night because yep. it's going through my head. And, and you can't watch two movies at the same time. And so if you're trying to write, you're having to watch the movie that you're trying to write. Mm -hmm. And the best, your mind is never cleanest is when you wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Now, some people need to write at night. Some people can't do this. But many of the writers I know like the morning for that reason. I used to not be a morning person whatsoever. And my family will testify to that, including my older sister, who used to right. never talk to me growing up in the mornings because I was miserable until I started to write. And then I used that time in the morning when I was quiet to write what I can. And then it felt like that was such a great way besides exercising to start my day. Yeah, and I feel the most productive in my world when I have had time to write in the morning and exercise, then I can start the rest of the busy day of mom, wife, yeah, you know, yeah, work yeah. or whatever. And it, I feel centered versus the days that that doesn't happen. That's exactly what I do. I get up, I write and I exercise. That's yep. exactly how yep. I start. Actually, you know what I do first is I meditate. Which yeah, because it kind of that clears your head again sometimes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's helpful too. Yeah, I love meditation. So I also have found my most productive writing scenes. I call it, you know, chapters or scenes have come out of you know coming out of being a, asleep into waking. Yeah. You know those moments when it's yeah, so yeah, yeah. creative, and it's like yeah. I have to get the scene down right now because. Yep. I'll never remember this. And it's so beautiful. So, sure. so yeah, so, so I'm getting there and it's, it's a process, you know, and that's what, why I bring a lot of authors on this podcast, you know, it's to encourage me and to encourage other people out there that are on whatever part of that journey they're on, you know, to know that a, you're not alone and yeah. B there it's a process and it's a creative process. So it's one that I'm not sure. Well, I don't remember growing up hearing about the creative process. No, you know, no. most, most houses are not creative household. Yeah. yeah.